I got this pulse sensor of AliExpress. Let's experiment with it. The sensor has three wires going into it. The wires on the side are marked. The left side has an S, which I assume is a signal wire, and on the right there is a minus, which should be ground. To get an idea of how the sensor signal looks like, I powered it with 3.3 volts and tried to look at the signal with an oscilloscope. The output was all over the place while I was moving it around, however once I had my finger steady you can identify a heartbeat. My entry level oscilloscope is not a great tool for this. I could not find a way to zoom in on the signal and this is the best I could do. I should be able to focus more on the signal when using a microcontroller. For this project I decided to start from an empty project and add all required dependencies myself. I start with Cargo New, after which I will do all my edits in Sublime. The first change is adding dependencies to Cargo.toml. The dependencies section lists what the project builds upon. Since the project runs on bare metal, meaning no operating system, I will need to add some general hardware support libraries. In Rust, such support is provided at three different levels. The most basic one is the microcontroller, which in my case is a Cortex-M3. This only provides functionality that is common across all microcontrollers and generally you want a bit more abstraction than that to make the code more readable and simple. The next level is the hardware abstraction layer that is specific to the microcontroller itself and if available to the board. In my case, I'm running on the STM discovery board, so I import the corresponding dependencies, a generic STM 32F3 hardware abstraction layer and the discovery board specific dependence. The discovery board create provides things like accessing LEDs and buttons available on the board. I will not use those in this project, however, since I'm adding dependencies, I figured I will add this dependency as well. As a last dependency, I'm adding some real-time transfer support. This works by allowing the microcontroller to use a portion of RAM to write data and the computer to which the board is connected to can read this data. I'll use this to view the program output. Since we are running in bare metal mode, I add the relevant directives and I mark the main function as entry for the program. As I save the file, my linter starts validating and I fix the errors one by one. First of all, the program cannot return, since we are running no operating system, there is nothing to return to. Next, I need to determine what happens in case Rust detects a runtime error. This is handled in a panic handler and I set things up so that the handler provided by the real-time transfer library is used. At this point, the build is still set on the default settings and the linter thinks that this program is to run on my Linux machine. So we create a .cargo directory and place a configuration file in there. Cargo is an all-in-one tool used for Rust development. It does code checking, compilation, in our case it can also handle running the program on the discovery board. I set the default build target to the correct value for my board and then configure the build options. Autocomplete gets the better of me here and instead of Rust flags it completes the build Rust flags. I will only catch this error later. Finally I get some options for the release builds for the future. It is hard to see that the program is running for a program that just busy loops. Let's initialize the real-time transfer functionality and output something like the popular Hello World. I try to build and it fails, so I have to fix the build target typo. Once this is fixed, the program still does not run, complaining about interrupt vectors not being set. Interrupt vectors represent what code is to be executed when something happens. Interrupts are things like timers or when some pin change when something external triggers it, like a button or a sensor. In particular, remember the entry macro to, with, with which the main is flagged? The name main has no meaning for the microcontroller, instead the address of main has to be placed in the right spot for the microcontroller to know that it should start executing there. The hardware abstraction layer provides a prelude import that will set everything up, assuming correct macros are used. I already configured main as entry, so we only need to import a prelude.
while I'm at it, I also add the boilerplate code for initializing a microcontroller to a known state. Establish connections to its peripheral abstractions and set the default clock configuration. Notice how the Rust type system forces me to link things together correctly. When changing clock speed of the microcontroller, its ability to read from flash will be affected as both microcontroller and flash run on the clock we are changing. The Rust abstractions make sure that I explicitly mark everything that can change as mutable and the clock configuration call explicitly mentions that it may affect the flash and it requires exclusive access to it. For the next step, I want to be able to get the current time and delay execution. This is a bit more complex for my microcontroller since I have no actual clock. If I am able to get the current time, sleep should be easy. Just do nothing until the desired time is reached. For the do-nothing part, assembly language provides a no-op operation, which is literally do-nothing. However, in my case, I know I will rely on interrupts to update the next time, so I wait for the next interrupt to happen before the sleep wakes up. For the actual implementation, I want to count the number of milliseconds that have passed. For this, I create a structure containing a 64-bit number that will get incremented as time passes. I also know that this will depend on the system timer to get updated, so I add this member in the structure to explicitly say that once the structure is used, it relies on the system timer not changing. Once I save the file, the linter starts complaining about unused code. I'll make it used soon. For now, let's implement a tick counter. Tick will get called when to increment the number of milliseconds one by one. Get will be called to fetch the current counter value. The tick counter will be read from the main program and updated from an interrupt, so I set it up as a shared resource using a mutex. The mutex will enforce that modifications do not conflict with each other. Since I am up thinking only a number on a single core processor, this could have probably been done with an atomic operation, but using a mutex is easy enough and generic. Now that I have global access to the tick counter, the millis function can be implemented. The hardware abstraction forces me to be explicit about disabling interrupts while reading the timer. This ensures that the system tick counter will not update the value while it's being read. It is a good idea to make the part that has interrupts disabled as short as possible. The final step in having working time is to set up the system clock when creating a tick counter structure. I set the clock source as the core clock since I know how fast the core clock runs. Then ask for an interrupt to be generated 1000 times per second. This is done by telling the clock to run a counter based on the frequency of the core. When the counter reaches zero, it will trigger an interrupt and start counting again. Once everything is enabled, the, a valid tick counter can be returned.
In main, we initialize the global tick counter, which will immediately take effect. I also want to see this working, so we add a counter and a new message every second. Finally, we implement the interrupt handler for when the clock interrupt fires. This is done via the exception macro and by matching the expected function name with the, what the macro expects. The handler function name cannot be changed, so I resilence the linter for the name of this particular function. Cargo build finishes without warnings and run displays messages every one second. Great! Reading an analog pin is now simple. First, analog to digital converters will need access to some clock configuration, so we mark the clock configuration registers mutable. I decided to use the pin marked PA2 for reading the sensor value. To enable this, the analog to digital converter with index 1 is used. I initialize ADC1 and then I configure the general purpose IO for PA2 to be into analog mode since we will be reading analog values. I will sleep for a very short time and print out the current time and analog value to the console. Notice how the type system ensures that I link things correctly. The microcontroller requires ADC1 to be used when reading PA2 and this is reflected in the code. The code compiles and runs. Next step is to connect the sensor and display it in some way. The easiest way to show some display is using the feed GNU plot program. It can be set up to display a line graph based on XY pairs received from the command line. Here's how it looks like. It took a while to stabilize, but at the end we can see the pulse. In a future video, I will create a better viewer for this, as using feed GNU plot feels limiting. I hope this video was interesting or helpful. Let me know what you think in the comments. Goodbye.